this could be the funeral for your business. Today we're going to share five lessons that we've learned that could kill your business if you don't follow them. These are things that we've run into problems with, or we've seen our friends run into problems with, and we don't want your business to suffer the fate that... Theirs did. And quite frankly, we don't want to go to your business's funeral. We don't have the time to, and airline tickets are expensive. And we don't want to see your business fail. Yeah, that one most importantly. <laughs> don't kill your business. <laughs> okay, we're done. All right, you saw the title, you suffered mm -hmm. through that intro. Let's get started. The intro was my idea. <laughs> it was pretty funny, Oh, but it's kind of cheesy. So the first thing that will kill your business is having a low self-confidence or a lack of awareness on your skills. I understand that you're just trying to be humble, you don't want to brag or anything like that, but when somebody comes to you and says, hey, can you build this or do you think you could do something like this and they show you a picture on their phone, you need to have a very confident yes response. You don't need to lie about your skill set, but you shouldn't play it safe either because they're looking to you for comfort and confidence. If they don't think that you can build it, they're gonna find somebody else that can. The more comfortable that they are that you can pull off the dream that they have in their head of their furniture, the more likely they are to spend the money. If they kind of sense that you're not very confident about your skills or that maybe you can't pull it off, and then you go to try to charge top dollar like you should, it's not gonna work out for you. So don't be humble, be very self-aware of your skill set, and don't brag about it, but say, yeah, it's gonna be challenging, but I can definitely pull it off. Or just say, yeah, I built something very similar to this before, I'm sure that I can knock this out of the park. Have confidence in yourself, and your customers will have confidence in you. All right, so the second thing that will kill your woodworking business is explaining too much. Basically, the customer does not care about all of the specifics. They don't need to know every single little detail of how you're gonna make the glue up and then you're gonna put it through the planer and then you're gonna scrape the glue and stain it this way. That's what they're paying you for, <laughs> is to make those decisions and know how to do everything. So when you're explaining a project to them, explain it enough just to give them the idea, the overall idea of what it's gonna look like, the kind of style they're going for. So if that means drawing it up quick on SketchUp, taking a tablet and drawing it out, something like that. Explain it to the point where they understand what it's gonna look like, but don't go way too in depth. They're not woodworkers. That's why they're not making it themselves. And honestly, it's gonna turn them off a little bit to you and your business if you spend like 15 minutes just talking about things that they don't even understand. So you also wanna limit the number of choices that your customer has to make about a piece. And the limited options that you're giving them, make sure you're using like normal people words and not woodworker words. Say, hey, what kind of wood do you want? Do you want dark wood or do you want light wood? You don't have to walk them through and say, do you want a walnut slab or would you like oak? They're not necessarily gonna understand that much. And if you're talking about stain, say, would you like a light stain, a dark stain or a gray stain? You don't have to go into depth how there's three different shades of brown that you have that they could pick from. Just ask them simple questions like that. We're talking simple options so you don't confuse them. And that also is gonna boost their confidence in you because they can tell you already know the exact questions to ask people to get it done and get it done right. So bottom line, don't give people too many options or decisions to make because then they'll never make a decision. If you've ever been to a restaurant where there's like a thousand things on the menu, you spend way too much time figuring out what you want and not making a decision at all. And it goes the same way for your customers. All right, so number three we're both doing because this is something we both struggle with. Keep good, accurate, solid records. I understand it's not fun. It's never fun to be organized, but you got to do it. Some of these woodworkers though, I don't know. They love organizing. Yeah, okay, that's not us. But <laughs> still, keep good records. Make, make your customers sign contracts, mm -hmm. keep email traffic, keep a solid record of everything you do. Especially for taxes, you wanna make sure that you have all your business expenses accounted for. We use, we even pay for QuickBooks software so we don't even have to think about it. It's all kept 
in a record for us. So you don't have to make an Excel sheet and keep everything line by line. Find some sort of system that works for you where you can keep accurate records. And honestly, this is to keep both you and your customers safe. If you keep a record of every contract you've signed and when this person agreed to get the project done by, agreed that you could start work, maybe paying 50% up front, all that stuff. So if they come back and say, no, you never said that, or no, you never said I needed to pay half up front first before you started, you can pull that out, whether hard copy or electronically and say, no, actually you did. So that's keeping you safe. And also it keeps the customer safe because if you said something that you don't quite remember, then they're protected. It just keeps everybody safe. Also, it helps with your portfolio. If you don't remember how much you charged a customer mm -hmm. previously, and then they want a bigger piece of furniture and you want, you don't remember, like you can't go back and find out like, oh, what did I charge them for a coffee table? And then when they're asking for a huge hutch that costs the same amount, they're gonna scratch their heads and wonder, why is this the same price? Yes. Which we'll get to that a little bit later, but you wanna keep good accurate records so that you can make everything look consistent, professional, and organized. It'll kill your credibility. Yeah, if, like if you have no credibility, yeah. you're not gonna be able to charge the amount of money you need to charge mm -hmm. to make a profit. All right, so what are we on, number four? Uh, yeah. Okay, number four. Uh, don't miss deadlines. Now the obvious one is yes, don't miss your delivery date. Whatever you do, try to come in under budget and ahead of the timeline. If you can give somebody a text message or a phone call a couple of days early that says, hey man, I'm ready before schedule. They're like, that never happens in this industry. When people are gonna spend a lot of money on custom stuff, speed becomes the differentiator. Like what put, what separates you from the other guy is speed. You also need to allow for a little bit of wiggle room, you know? Maybe that means closing deals at 10% higher profit margin than you're expecting, just so you can come in for the customer and say, hey, I actually came in a little bit under budget on the materials. I'm gonna pass that savings on to you. So then you're under budget and you're ahead of the timeline. That customer is gonna stick with you for life because you did it better than what they were expecting. And that's what's gonna help your business. Now, if you're over budget and over timeline, that's the number one complaint you hear about people in the skilled trades, whether that be contractors, plumbers, electricians, whatever, is that they came in over timeline and over budget. But if you can flip that and do the opposite, then you're gonna get more business than you can handle, which is a good thing. So God forbid something does happen and you miss a deadline, be upfront, call early, say, hey, I know that I told you that I was gonna deliver it next Saturday, but I'm having a little bit of trouble. This is on me, it's not. It's nothing you did, but I, you know, I didn't plan very well enough. Is it okay if I deliver it to you a week later? Is that okay? And then just be upfront about it. Most, most people are gonna be reasonable and understand. Those that aren't reasonable, maybe offer them a discount. You know, there's different ways you can build that into your pricing structure. But bottom line, be upfront, be transparent. Don't try to hide anything or wait till the last minute. You know, don't try to show up at their house at 11 p.m. and say, oh, I made my delivery date. Like that's just gonna be a nightmare. Be upfront, be honest and just work with people, develop relationships. This, like, this should be a people game. And then when you make your secondary deadline or budget, do not do that again. Give yourself extra wiggle room, whatever you need to do, but do not have to say it's gonna be late twice or over budget twice. Give them one final answer and then make your word your word and then just apologize profusely. And uh, we haven't had a problem with customers yet managing them that way. Boy. All right, tell me when. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just really bad. It was so great. What, what's, number, what's number five? <laughs> All right, number five is a trap that I fell into when I first started making things and trying to sell them. I thought that I wasn't getting enough money for my projects because I didn't build it good enough or I was cutting too many corners or my production, like my, my quality of my work wasn't good enough to demand the high prices that the professionals charge. That's total and utter garbage. Just a beginning woodworker can already make things that are way better in quality than Ikea and Walmart and Target sell on a day-to-day -day basis. So if your prices are at least not equivalent or 50% higher than your local furniture store, like a real furniture store, like an Ashley or some like equivalent furniture manufacturer prices, you're not charging enough. Again, don't sell yourself short. Your stuff is worth it. Most of your customers are not expecting your furniture to last 
six or seven generations. If they are, holy snot, should they be paying for it in the thousands of dollars range. Most people aren't expecting the furniture to last much longer than 10 years. So if you can get 20 years out of a piece, charge them several hundred bucks or a couple thousand dollars for it, they're gonna be more than happy. From what we've noticed, people just really care about the furniture being able to make a few moves into different houses or apartments. As long as it can go on a moving truck and get banged around a little bit and still not be rickety, that's all they really care about. So the number one thing here is you need to learn sales skills. You don't have to become a sleazy used car salesman or anything like that, but if you'll spend just a couple hours a week for a few months reading sales books, watching online tutorials, if you want to watch, if you like our content, we have sales programs. It's always the first link in the description. You need to be interested in learning how to sell, not because you're trying to rip people off, but because you're trying to convey to the layperson just how high a quality your furniture really is. The average person doesn't understand the difference between particle board and solid wood. They really Really don't. That's why they spend thousands of dollars at Ikea and then wonder why their furniture doesn't make the next move to their new apartment. You have to be able to convey that in a way that's easy for them to digest, that doesn't saturate them with too much woodworking knowledge that's not going to be of any use to them. So that's what sales is. It's a relationship with the customer to where you can, as the expert, can convey things very simply to your customer without overwhelming them with the technical details. That's all I mean by learning sales. The more that you can learn how to do that and agree on a price that's fair to both you and the customer, the better off you're going to be. So learn sales, don't sell yourself short, and understand that building it better will not make your furniture sell much better. Word of mouth is gonna spread much faster if you develop good relationships with your customers than the quality of your work, at least in our experience. All right, bonus tip. Ready for the bonus tip? You want the bonus tip? He's like, yes, just give me the treat. Here you go. Bonus tip. All right, so bonus tip. The last thing that will absolutely kill your woodworking business is saying no for the customer. Let the customer say no for themselves. If you are offering to make somebody a $10,000 desk and it's gonna be a high quality desk, all the bells and whistles, and you're kind of afraid that it might be a little too expensive or a $10,000 desk is gonna be out of their budget, don't decide that for them. Pitch them the $10,000 high quality desk. And if it's too high, let them say no for themselves. Because by you saying no, you've already eliminated all possibility of saying, you know what? Yeah, maybe I would like a $10,000 desk. Don't eliminate the potential to make a $10,000 sale. So this is something that I actually almost did. I almost made this mistake. Um, if you go look at this video up here of this desk that we made, other side. Davis is pointing to the other side. Look here. The video where we made this desk for my friend, she was going back to school. Um, when we first drew it up, we came up with this super cool idea and we're like, what if we did a solid walnut slab? We're gonna dye the slats to match all of her furniture. And by the time we added it all up, it was about a $3,000 desk. It was cool, but it was a $3,000 desk. And I was afraid to pitch that to her. I wanted to pitch her something closer to about seven $700, maybe up to a thousand. All right, so Jenny just got off the phone with her first real sales call. Yay! Uh, I asked to film it, she didn't want to. <laughs> I was kind of scared to pitch her 3,000 because I felt like she was just gonna straight up say no. Uh, and then Davis was like, why not? Like, let's just pitch it. And I'm like, you know what? You're right, let's just do it. So we did, I just pitched her the 3,000 and sure enough, she came back and said, hey, 3,000 is a little too high. Fair, okay. But we settled somewhere around $1,500. After looking at everything she wanted involved in that piece, $1,500 versus the 700 I was gonna pitch her because I was too scared to pitch her what the desk was worth, I'm not making twice the money that I would have been making if I you know, kind of chickened out and didn't pitch her the full price. So never say no for the customer because even if they say no to the first high price you pitch them, you'll probably end up somewhere much higher than you were originally thinking. All right, so hopefully this video wasn't too dark and depressing for you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you did click on a video that was titled five things that will kill your woodworking business, but thanks for sticking with us. These are just things that we've learned. And honestly, we've made a lot of these mistakes too. Um, and then, but you know, caught them before they did kill our business. So we just wanted to be really honest and upfront and open and pass them on to you so you don't make the mistakes. Let us know down in the comments if there's anything that we forgot. You know, there's other lessons that we can learn and share with each other. So if there's a, a way that you almost 
almost ruined your business or something that took you a long time to finally get yeah. through your, your stubborn head? Because a lot of us woodworkers, we tend to be pretty stubborn with our own ways. So No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not stubborn. <laughs> I'm so understanding. <laughs> So if there's anything that you've learned that you want to share uh, with the rest of the class, feel free to leave it down in the comments. Anyway, uh, what are we going to do with that sign now? Save it for Halloween. <laughs> Brucey, <laughs> you're on camera. This, this is going on the internet, Bruce. Is that really what you want to be known for? <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> uh. All right, if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button. It really helps us out a lot. Thumbs up, like this video. <laughs> he has no thumbs. Don't let him, don't let him. We haven't told him that yet. <laughs> we'll tell him when he's older. <laughs> he doesn't have thumbs. Why would you ruin this for him? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>